Excited this morning to kick off this series on the end times. And uh, today, uh, as, as I do so, I, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm not an expert in any of this. But here's, here's what I can tell you. Uh, the things that are happening in our world make us step back a little bit and go, what in the world is happening? How, I, I mean, ha- have you come to this place where oftentimes you're going, none of this really makes sense. Anybody else or is that just me? I'm trying to make sense out of a lot of things that are going on. And honestly, if we're just looking at it with, with our own human eyes, uh, it doesn't make sense. But it's incredible when you take time to look into God's word and realize how much of what's going on in the world is right here in a book that was written two to 3,000 years ago. To details, it's incredible. So I'm excited. You know that 30% of what's in the Bible is prophetic. It's prophecy. And most of that prophecy is about the end times. And so I think it's very appropriate for us to to take time in the next four weeks. We're going to do that in the morning service and the evening service. So uh, eight eight service times we're going to be doing this. And I'm I'm, I'm excited. I know that there's going to be some information that we're going to be privy to that maybe we haven't heard before. Some of it might just be refreshing to us. But what we hope in the whole big picture of this is that it's motivational and inspirational for us to stay focused and to be doing what we're supposed to be doing right here in this world, knowing uh, that the signs of the times are telling us that we're near, we're near the end. I believe that with all of my heart. I'm so glad that you're here today. I don't know if you came today just because we're talking about the end times or if you really love the church. You love God's house. How many of you love God's house? I mean, you love to be together. You love to worship together. How many of you are looking forward to heaven? Man, you know what? We get just a little bit of a glimpse of heaven when we come together to worship together like this. What do you think we're going to be doing when we get to heaven? This! Only a lot... It's like on steroids, this. We're all going to be together worshiping God, and so we get just a little taste of heaven. And that's why I think it's important that we say, you know what, I'm not going to miss. I'm going to be in church. I'm going to be there to worship because I love God so much. I love Jesus. I love his people, and I love to worship him. And we have an opportunity to to get just a little glimpse or a taste of what heaven's going to be like. And you never know who you're going to touch and impact and influence and make a difference in their life because that's what we're that's what we're called to do. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Over and over, Jesus gives us glimpses into the fact that he is is coming back. He's coming back. We need to be ready. We need to be watching. We need to be uh, reaching. We need to be doing all that we can And I have to say with Scotty Gibbons, who was in this pulpit last week, I love God's house. I love God's people. I love God with all of my heart. And I want to do all that I can for him. So I'm excited for this series. Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus is with his disciples. He's getting ready to ascend into heaven. He's been crucified, resurrected. He's spent about 40 days uh, with, his, with his disciples. And this is his words at the beginning of Acts. He says, uh, don't leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift that my father's promised. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. They didn't know that Jesus was getting ready to go to heaven. So they're asking him about his earthly reign and his earthly rule. In Acts chapter 1 verse 6, it says, So when the apostles were there with Jesus, they kept asking him. They kept asking him. They were asking him this question. Has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? They were wanting Jesus to set up an earthly kingdom. And his reply was this, the Father alone has authority to set those dates and times. They are not for you to know, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And after saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could see him no longer. And they strained to see him rising into heaven. Two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven. But someday he will return from heaven in the same way that you saw him go. Man, he's promised that he's coming back. 
over and over and over again in Scripture. And I'm going to share a lot of Scriptures with you this morning, and I understand that as we're looking to the return of Christ, some of these Scriptures are, are talking about the great catching away. We call it the rapture, where Jesus is going to come and, and take his church home. And then there's some verses that talk about the second coming of Jesus, which will be at the end of the, of the tribulation period. Um, and we're not going to get hung up on that this morning. We're just looking to the future and what he's promised, that he is coming back. And so we're looking at the signs of the times that point to his, his return. Jesus said, no one knows, this is Matthew 24, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself, only the Father knows. A couple of verses later in 42, he says, so you must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief. Paul's speaking to believers in verse 4 where he says, you aren't in the dark about these things, brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. And the reason that we as believers, we as followers of Christ, shouldn't be surprised. He said, the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night, unannounced. No thief announces, hey, I'm going to break into your house tonight about 1.30 in the morning. No, if you had, if you had an idea that somebody was going to break into your house, I guarantee you, you're setting up waiting. You're not going to let them just come in while you're sleeping and take your stuff. And Jesus is saying, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be. It's going to seem like that to the world, but you shouldn't be surprised because I've given you uh, this foreknowledge to say, I am coming back. And you are to keep watch. You're to stay alert. You're to be clear-minded, sober. You're to be ready all the time. We have a heads up to what's coming, but we don't know when. The Bible gives us signs, and we're looking to those signs this morning. And here's what I want to say at the very beginning. Of all the things going on in the world that point to his return, here's what I want to tell you, because it, it is so easy for us to get our eyes off of God's plan and his purpose and to be discouraged and disappointed, frustrated and mad and things that are going on in the world. But here's what I want you to remember. God is in control, not the devil. God is in control, not the devil. And so as we look around, like I said, the times that we live in, uh, we, we may experience a lot of emotions because it feels like to us that the world is falling apart, that it's coming uh, apart at the seams, so to speak. But in the context of Scripture, things aren't falling apart. I believe that everything is falling into place. I believe with all of my heart that we're living in the end of times. I, I don't know how close, I don't know how far away. It sure feels like it's near, and it's an exciting time for us as Christians. I remember as a child, probably third or fourth grade, um, back in the 70s at church, we watched a movie called A Thief in the Night. That was filmed right here in Des Moines. And it was so, so real, and it scared the snot. I said the liver out of me before. I still have my liver. But I lived with this fear of, of the return of Christ, and, uh, and it shouldn't be a fearful thing. We should be excited. Um, but I believe with all my heart that these are the most exciting times for us to be alive, and I believe that our best days are still ahead of us. And when we consider all the scriptures about the end times and we look around at our world, the duff factor ought to, ought to just factor in more and more. It's like we read the scripture and go, oh yeah, duh, right? It, it, it puts it in context. I'm going to stay really close to my notes this morning, and I'm going to try to go fast because i got a lot, of, a lot of stuff to share, but I hope that you'll stay with me. Uh, just want to point to a lot of the signs that are going on in the times, and the, by no means am I, am I touching everything. I'm just pulling out some highlights for you. The first sign of the times is just the time that we live in. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, he says, he turned to the crowd and he said, when you see the clouds beginning to form in the west, you say, here comes a shower, and you are right. And when the south wind blows, you say, today will be a scorcher, and it is, you fools. You know how to interpret the weather signs of the earth and sky, but you don't know how to interpret the present times. You see, if we were at half as discerning about uh, spiritual things as we are the weather, where would our lives be? I mean, we talk about the weather all the time. That's what we talk about with people, right? Hey, it's a sunny day, right? Captain Obvious, you know, we're not really talking about the weather. We're just going, hey, the sun. 
Hey, it's raining. Hey, what'd you think of that storm last night? We talk about the weather all the time. Do we talk about things more important than that? You see, the people that Jesus was talking to in this passage, they could predict a storm. They could, uh, but they couldn't see the coming judgment. They seemed to know what the temperature was going to change, but they couldn't interpret the signs of the times. We've got an educated world with a lot of scientific knowledge, but not a lot of spiritual wisdom. Tilly Smith and her family were relaxing on the beach during a family vacation in Thailand. That morning, 10-year-old Tilly, her parents, and her sister Holly went for a walk on Makao Beach. They enjoyed the warm breeze in their faces. They felt the sand squish between their toes. Two weeks prior to their vacation, Tilly had learned about tsunamis in a geography class. She did not find geography interesting, but the video that her teacher showed caught her attention. So as Tilly and her family walked on the beach, she noticed the waves going out, but not coming back in. Tilly alerted her parents that they were surrounded with signs that she had learned just a couple of weeks ago in her geography class, signs of something unusual and potentially cataclysmic was going to happen. And at first they were just kind of dismissive, but Tilly, um, her passion and her persistence uh, continued. She began shouting, there's going to be a tsunami. Tilly shouted louder and louder, and her panic frightened her younger sister, who began to sob hysterically. So Tilly's dad took her younger sister, Holly, back to the hotel to calm her down. But Tilly looked around and saw people in the ocean, people on the beach, and she just knew in her heart that everyone was in danger. Tilly ran back to the hotel to find her dad talking with the security guard. He said, I know this sounds completely mad, but my daughter is convinced that there's going to be a tsunami. And that security guard listened not to the weather expert, but to a passionate plea from a 10-year-old British schoolgirl. He shouted for people to get off the beach, and people scattered all over the place as pandemonium set in. That hotel lobby on a higher floor became a gathering place, and a tsunami triggered by an earthquake on the floor of the Indian Ocean struck. And that tsunami, which came in December of 2004, killed an estimated 230,000 people. But not one person on Tilly's beach lost their life. That's incredible. Because a 10-year-old girl saw the signs, and she's going, wait, this, this clicks. This makes sense to me. This is not good. This is terrible. There is doom coming, and I better tell somebody. Listen, if we understand the signs that are going on around us in our world, and we don't say anything, what's wrong with us? The times are telling us that Jesus' return is soon. And listen, it's not like you got to like create pandemonium. It's, it's the fact that you need to let people know, hey, I'm clued into what's going on here, and I'm just telling you, it sure looks like what could happen. Paul said to Timothy, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. Sounds a lot like social media. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, and they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Listen, these are just some of the signs of the last days. So one of the signs is the times that we live in. Another sign is is truth and morality. I don't know if you have realized this. Spoil alert. A moral shift has taken place in our nation. There's a dramatic falling away of traditional values and biblical morality and truth The truth is so hard to find in the days that we live in. And we see it in America because we live here, but this is is a worldwide thing. It's not just in America. Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, that Jesus will not return. That day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God, a great falling away, a worldwide falling away from the truth. Does that not sound familiar? The Greek word is apostasia. It's the root of the word apostasy, which means a widespread rejection, in this case, of biblical Christianity. This is the moral and spiritual condition of our current times. 
Those of us who are older would say for sure that the world is a much different place today than when I was a kid. How many of you would say that's true? The world is very different. It's a very different place for my kids and now my grandkids than it was for me when I grew up. Some of you remember when your school day began with prayer in the name of Jesus in the public school. How many of you remember that? Look at all the hands. I don't remember that, but I do remember praying before uh, sporting events. But here's the thing. In June 1962, a landmark case ended prayer in public schools. The following year, 1963, a court case disallowed daily Bible reading in school. And in 1980, the Supreme Court ruled against a Kentucky law that required the Ten Commandments to be on the wall in every single classroom. And so prayer, Bible reading, and Ten Commandments taken out of the public school. Is it any wonder why we're in the shape that we're in today? Why we're on a downhill slide? We're living in a postmodern, post-Christian, post-biblical culture. There's a rise in atheism. 35% of millennials claim no religion at all. Almost 56 million Americans see no purpose for religion in their lives. There's a drift away from God, away from Bible, away from the truth. And in the last 50 years, it's picking up momentum. And listen, it's not just a shift in the culture. There is a major drift happening in the church There are a lot of churches who are openly rejecting clear teachings of the Bible. Many churches and entire denominations are pro-abortion. There are growing numbers of churches that are ordaining, practicing homosexuals, promoting same-sex marriages in their church. That issue alone is not only dividing churches, it's dividing denominations in two. Many churches no longer believe in the inerrancy or the authority of the scriptures. Those same churches don't believe that there's an actual hell or a Satan. And I just have a question. The, Bible, uh, the, 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 the polls say that less than half of American Christians believe that there's a devil. And I just, what, what I don't understand is if the Bible is lying to us about hell, why do they, why do they think that the Bible's truthful about heaven? If there's one thing that is, is, is wrong and an error in the Bible, shouldn't we just throw the whole thing away? It's either true or it's not. There is a real hell. There is a real Satan. There is a real heaven. And I'm going there. I'm choosing heaven. I, I hope that you do too. Jesus is coming and I want to be ready. I believe there's a lot of churches who are holding firm to the truth. They love Jesus. They're looking for and anticipating his return. But in many churches and denominations, there's a bold rejection of the teachings of Jesus and the scriptures. Second Thessalonians 2, 3, Paul said, For that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. Let me remind you again that God is in control, not the devil that Jesus is returning, and no one can stop him. Jesus said this, when you see these things begin to happen, look up, for salvation is near. So not only are the signs of, of, of time and truth, uh, another big sign is that of technology. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, a very prophetic book, said this, but you, Daniel, keep this prophecy a secret. Seal it up in the book until the time of the end, when many will rush here and there, and knowledge will increase. In the end, it will be marked by people going to and fro, going here and there, and and knowledge increasing. Both travel and knowledge increase. Does that seem like something that may be happening in our day? You see, about 100, 120 years ago, 20 to 40 miles is about as far as you would go with a hard days, a hard day of walking on foot or maybe riding a horse. Some of you came at least that, and some of you more than that, just to come to church today in a car. So travel, people going here and there. In 1913, think about this timeline. 1913, the Model T Ford was the first car to be mass produced. That's just a little over 100 years ago. The late 1950s was when commercial airline travel became more commonplace. And I would guess that the vast majority of us sitting in this room have traveled uh, on an airplane. How many of you have traveled on an airplane? Just raise your hand high. The vast majority of us. How many of you have traveled internationally? Does it sound like our day? People will be going to and fro. 
and knowledge will increase. Has knowledge changed in our lifetime? I don't know if you've seen this before, but Buckminster Fuller, that's quite a name, came up with a knowledge doubling curve. And he came up with these stats that until 1900, knowledge doubled about every 100 years. But then at World War II, 1945, it was estimated that knowledge was doubling at a rate of every 25 years. And when he came up with his chart in 1982, he was estimating that knowledge is doubling about every year, about every 12 months. And today, knowledge is doubling every 12 hours. There is almost 50 billion devices connected to the internet of things. Things are changing in our world, vastly changing. It's a sign of, of, of the times. Travel and knowledge, uh, instant global information. There's a prophecy that's pointing today to our advanced technology. There are, um, in Revelation chapter 11, mentioned about two witnesses. Now the setting for this is, is Jerusalem, and the setting is during the tribulation. It's actually in the middle of the tribulation period, three and a half years into the tribulation. So the rapture has occurred, and, and here these guys are, these two witnesses are allowed to preach in Jerusalem, they're allowed to preach on behalf of God for 1,260 days, which equals about three and a half years. So we're right in the middle of that seven-year period. And it says that they perform miracles, that they can't be harmed, that God's hand is protecting them, that no one can touch them. There's even talk of fire coming out of their mouths. But after they finish their job, God allows them to be killed. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 7 to 9, when they complete their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit will declare war against them, and he will conquer them and kill them. And their bodies will lie in the main street of Jerusalem, the city that is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, the city where the Lord was crucified. And for three and a half days, all peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will stare at their bodies. No one will be allowed to bury them. You see, this event was, seemed uh, completely impossible at any other time in history before ours. Previous generations would only guess or scratch their heads, how, how could this be that all peoples, tribes, languages, and nations would stare at these two bodies that are dead lying in the street in Jerusalem, that are allowed to lay there for three and a half days? Some of you have heard of John Hagee, pastors of church in San Antonio. His father, William, was also a preacher. And in the 1920s and 30s, when he was preaching, he preached on the end times. This is a, a decade or two before Israel became a nation in 1948. So we haven't even talked about Israel, and we won't talk about that today, but that will be coming up, I think, tonight in Prophecies Fulfilled. But in his message, he said, the end cannot come until one, Israel is a nation, and two, until all the world can see the same thing at the same time. And those people in the 1920s, I'm sure they're going, well, what, how is that going to happen? How hard is it for us to imagine this event? We just pull out our, our device, pull up our news feed our social media channels, all of us could be watching the same thing that's happening in Israel at the same time. We're catching the live stream. We're seeing it all happen in real time. Not hard for us to imagine. Do you think this is a sign? It could be a sign. I think it is. It's easy for us to picture because it's real. It's a sign of technology. The advancements of technology are foreshadowed even in the scripture. Another thing is the global financial control. We see in the end times, the scriptures of the rise of a, a world ruling superpower that is called the beast. And the Bible tells us that he will exercise unprecedented control over people, much like we saw in the Roman Empire, but so much bigger and way more modern. In chapter 13 of Revelation, verse 15 to 17, it talks about the ruler who uh, will, he will punish and kill those who refuse to worship the beast. Verse 16, he says, he required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. We notice that anybody who refused to be part of this satanic system are cut off from buying and selling. The economic stream is, is turned off. Man, sounds familiar. Could be a sign of the days that we live in. I think it is. 
The only way that you could do this would be on a, on a, on a global scale would be with a cashless uh, economic system. Only cashless digital system can you fully trace and fully control the, the economy, people's money. I want you to know that Sweden is set to be completely cashless by March of 2023, just a year and a half away. We're not far behind them. Think about how much of your uh, transactions, financial transactions happen digitally with a credit card or a debit card or online billing or automatic deposit or Apple Pay or whatever it might be, just the tap of your phone and you've already paid your bill. Not hard for us to imagine, but that's the only way that he would be able to control that. And listen, in the day that we live in, it's not hard for us to see it's a sign of our time. It's not a stretch to, to conclude how technology would be a big part of the Antichrist power. Technology might not be the mark of the beast, but it definitely will be used to enforce that. With advances in technology, it creates a potential of some very slippery slopes when it comes to ethics and morals. We talk about human engineering or genetic modifications, cloning, even crossbreeding of animals and humans. There's, there's stuff like that being tested and tried out. There's a new term that, is, that has come up, and that's transhumanism. And it's this idea that we make a, a, a superhuman. It's, it's, it's the fantasy world. It's... it's uh, it's Captain America type stuff. They think it can be reality. The idea that we could connect a person's brain to the internet. Listen, when we, when we get to that, uh, if we can get to that time, we've crossed way over. We're in trouble. Potential for problems is, is great. It's mind boggling what can happen. So we need to come to this place to realize that the times that we're living in here in 2021 are serious. Listen, I haven't even talked about uh, the signs of wars and rumors of war and changes in weather and earthquakes and pestilence and disease, natural disaster, false prophets, increase of wickedness, and all the events around Israel, the nation. All of those are signs of the times too. These days are so drastically different from any generation before us and things are changing all the time. No wonder we're stressed out. Things are changing all the time. You ever, I mean, just stop and think, what in the world is going on? I'll tell you what's going on. Things are falling into place. Consider what we've witnessed just in the past year, the last five, 10 to 20 years, and we'll recognize the speed with which all of this is happening. I'm gonna ask Pastor Brett and the worship team to come, and I wanna conclude by re reiterating something that I've told you from the very beginning. The time of Jesus' return is soon. The signs of the times are pointing that we're in that time period. And we shouldn't be worried. We shouldn't be fearful. We shouldn't be discouraged. We should be excited. Jesus said, lift up your heads. Your salvation is drawing near. Lift up your heads. My return. I'm coming. And I'm going to snatch you out of all of this. How amazing is that? We live in a time where it very well could be that when, the, when, the, when Jesus returns and the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the air to be with him forever in heaven. I'm looking forward to heaven. That should not discourage us. It should just completely encourage us. We are closer to heaven. Come on, people. Heaven. <laughs> See, that's what happens. We, we get lulled into, ah, oh, yeah. Here's what you're saying, and you're Christians. Your followers are Jesus. We've heard all of this. This is, you know, that's in the Bible too. People saying, ah, yeah, we've heard all that. Where is that? Where is his coming? We've heard this from the time we were, we've been born. Me too. But we're getting in on the end of this thing. It's exciting. And I understand some of you got a lot of life ahead of you. And you're going, man, I'd really like to get married. I'd really like to have kids. I'd really like to experience this. Listen, what we're going to experience in heaven can't even begin to compare to anything, the best things that we can imagine of earth. And listen, we're going there. As followers of Jesus, we're going there. We should take as many people with us as we possibly can. This is the best thing you could give to people. The best thing is the hope of eternity in heaven with Jesus. The best thing is the hope of Jesus right here in this, in this world. That I don't have to be discouraged and, and frustrated and worried about the news. I don't live by the news. I live by this news. This is good news. 
the good news of Jesus, the promise of Jesus. And he's not let down on one of those promises. What he says, we can believe it. Man, this is exciting. We need to be telling people, how do we respond? We, we, need to be, we need to be right with God. Your kids, your grandkids, they need to be right with God. We need to be doing everything that we can do to tell them, hey, the waves are going out and they're not coming back in. Right? The signs. Just tell us that Jesus is returning. And what if he doesn't return in any of our lives? We still have the hope of heaven. Because if we don't go up in the, in the rapture, in the great catching away, we're going we're gonna to go like everybody else has gone before us. But we still have heaven to hope for. Man, that should encourage you. Don't set on the message. Don't not do anything about this. If you know that there's an impending disaster, that doom is coming, that something of cataclysmic proportions is going to take place, would you be like Tilly Smith and say, I'm telling everybody I can, and I'm saying it as loud as I can? That should be the thing that drives us. Heaven. Jesus. Jesus.